right. Okay. Yeah, maybe give some uh, hearts and emojis for the YouTube crowd, the millions of watchers that we don't have. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, but it's nice because then this, uh, this session also is available after the fact, which is always very interesting. Um, all right. We got lots of people in here. We got Brian at the back there. Wonderful. Ooh. Let's see. I know it's about one thirty in uh, one thirty in the U.S., but I'm from Europe. Anyone here from Europe? Give me some claps if you're here from Europe. Or yeah, lovely. Wonderful. Okay. Anybody from North America? Hearts from North America. Canada. USA, okay. Anybody from South America? Good for your time zones as well. Give me some smileys. We really have to work. Yes, love it. Where are you from, Oscar? From Colombia. From? I, I missed it. Uh, you said Colombia. Colombia. From Colombia. Fantastic. Wonderful. We we are working really hard to reach people. Um, all over the uh, all over the globe and all time zones. So it's always nice to know people are joining. Um, what about uh, we've had uh, North America, we've had South America, what was Central America? Missed Central America. I kind of sometimes count that in. Anyone smileys from Central America? Not yet. We will get you sooner or later. What about beyond? Uh, what about um, beyond Europe to the east? So Russia, Asia. Um, China, India, anybody from Australia? Most of those folks are probably asleep right now. Yeah. Except for right. the hard few, dedicated few. <laughs> All right. And what about uh, Africa? Anybody here from Africa? We get we get uh, visitors from Africa sometimes. Not this time. That's a shame. We will keep working on that as well. And just uh, so that you know, um, for everybody, um, we are, like I said, always looking for members and community uh, folk to join us. If you know of people out there, please share the Discord with them. Please share the Facebook group with them. You know, your colleagues, your friends, anyone who might be interested in the space, because um, the further we reach, the more the more impact we can have. So please consider that. Okay, I think we're going to start. It's uh, 32 past. So just before I introduce our guest here, uh, a quick word about Educators in VR. For most of you who know us, that's um, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, give us some, give us some hearts and smileys if you already <laughs> know us. Lovely. And anybody here for the first time at Educators in VR, give us some claps if you're here for the first time. We usually have a few. I have a few. Education and training, and we come from all uh, all walks of life, all time zones, and right around the globe. And we uh, we have these kind of events and workshops and trainings and uh, lectures. We also do two day, three day events. We did a summit in February, and we have a very active Discord channel, Discord server, which is a kind of a social networking platform, a communication platform, where we have 1,200 members, and we have quite a high ratio of active members who are sharing links, resources, ideas, impressions, problems, projects, research, summits. So please, 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 if you're not a member of the Discord or Facebook, join us there and link into the community. Right, having said that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Michael Casala here on my right. I'm just going to let you know a little bit about him. So as you can see on his um, slide here, it's the Chief Science Officer of Striver, but I'm going to give you a bit more detail than that. So Dr. Michael Casala is a cognitive neuroscientist who's a research is focused on understanding the biological underpinnings of learning and memory. His research is aimed at understanding how best optimize training for a variety of learning situations, as well as understanding how to optimize training in order to ensure maximum benefit to the learner. He's also led multi-year, multi-million dollar research projects aimed at understanding how virtual technologies can be used to facilitate the effectiveness of behavioral therapy and the brain's basis underlying such processes. 
His work has been published dozens of times in notable peer-reviewed journals such as Memory and Cognition and the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. At Striver, Dr. Kazala is able to blend his academic and applied research expertise to help develop training methodologies that optimize performance using immersive technologies as well as new analytic techniques in order to gain new insight into learner behaviors. So having heard uh, about uh, Michael Kasala, I'm going to hand over and I'm uh, waiting with bated breath to hear what he has to share with us today. Please give it up. Hearts and claps and smiles for uh, Michael Kasala. Um, I'm going to, oh, just to let you know also, sorry, <laughs> uh, I'm going to mute the audience. Uh, they are all muted. And afterwards, you will have the opportunity. If you have any questions, make a note of them. Uh, I will enable you to ask uh, Michael some questions afterwards. So with that, over to you, Michael. Hey guys, thanks for having me today. Um, and I will also be around uh, a little bit after the talk. Uh, if you guys have any kind of other questions you wanna ask, I think we might be joining outside um, even after the formal Q&A. All right, so welcome to the presentation. I'm excited, this is my first time doing a presentation in VR. Um, and and what, a, what an experience. This is kind of a, a, a really revelation for me in a lot of ways to really understand, you know, another venue for which we can start to maximize the benefit of, uh, of virtual technology. So, so very cool to be here, very cool to be presenting. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit today about the science of immersive learning. Um, obviously, this isn't going to be you know, uh, as in depth as we could probably go. Uh, there's a lot more to learn um, than what I have in these slides here, but this will give you kind of a brief tour of some of the work that's been done, you know, that precedes me and some of the work that we're doing at Striver to incorporate this wide body of research, the science of learning uh, and apply it to immersive technologies like VR. As Daniel mentioned, I am the uh, chief science officer of a company called Striver at Striver. We're, that's exactly what we're doing. We're using um, virtual technologies like VR to train workforces. And so uh, I'm excited to talk a little bit about that today. And I'll also talk about uh, some of the kind of analytics that we're using as well to gain, as Daniel mentioned, insights into the kind of learner behaviors, as it were, uh, which is helping also kind of further the learning benefit. Um, okay, so next slide, I'll just go through uh, briefly the agenda. Um, Oh, okay. I'll just talk about myself for a little bit, I guess. Okay. So like I said, the brief history, the science of immersive learning, and then the uh, analytics insights and beyond. Okay, great. So next slide. Um, so uh, actually, can we go back? I think it's back one. Um, I'll go, I'm sorry. So the one after, back, the, yeah, back one more. Sorry. Back one more. I'm, 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 we're, still, we're, we're, still, we're still kind of coordinating. The, okay. So this is me, and I'll just give you a brief history uh, of me as it applies to this work. So like Daniel mentioned, I'm, uh, I have a training in something called computational cognitive neuroscience. And so in an academic sense, I was doing a lot of work studying brain and behavior, all with the goal of understanding how people learn and how to optimize learning. So the idea being, if we can kind of know something biologically about how people learn, we can then maybe start to use that information to develop learning environments that are really kind of best suited for the learner. So the, generally the neuroscience of learning. Um, since then, I've done a bunch of things, uh, obviously most recently at Striver, but before that, I was looking at um, kind of other technologies. I remember if you guys remember the Kinect, the Microsoft Kinect, using that technology to really understand um, how we can create immersive environments and immersive games for children with high functioning autism. And so teaching them social skills, I'll get into the social skills element of what we train for uh, as well, a little bit later in this talk. But those, those efforts really kind of opened my eyes to the power of the technologies that have come uh, into our you know, society recently, things like the Kinect and obviously things like the, the different VR devices that we have now and the power that they bring with them to change behavior in a way that we're hoping to change behavior in pro-social ways, uh, in, in educational ways, et cetera. So that's what I'll uh, kind of focus my w uh, work at Striver and that's what I've been basically doing for the past few years at Striver. And so now we can go through the, to the next few slides. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm learning the ropes still here as well. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> okay, so the now we one. go to this one. That's yeah, perfect. So this is uh, this is an image of something called uh, of, of a door of something called the Virtual Human Interaction Lab, and so this is basically where Striver, the company, started um, in a lab at Stanford University. And so uh, I don't know how many of you people know uh, who Jeremy Balenson is. Um, Dr. Balenson is our co-founder at Striver. 
Uh, he's someone that's been using virtual reality to study social interactions for, for a couple decades now. And in fact, it was during my PhD work where I met Jeremy. So he and I go way back. Uh, I was not directly involved with the VR space back then. Uh, it looked very different, obviously, than it does now. Um, but I was always kind of tangentially interested and involved in that work and trying to understand, you know, hey, if we can start to study learning and kind of the computer-based paradigms that we have, if we can start to port those into VR, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be a great way to really start to understand from a realistic, real-world perspective um, how people behave and all the data that you can collect from that, et cetera? But that was always just a thought. Never really pursued it, always kind of interested. And then uh, about five years ago, he had a master's thesis student come uh, wanting to do a thesis project with him to understand if VR could be used to train American football players to learn basically the football plays better, right? So not really teaching them the motor aspects, but more teaching them the cognitive aspects of, of American football. And Jeremy uh, doesn't know anything about sports. <laughs> and so he, and he wasn't as kind of steep in the learning kind of research as I was, but obviously all of his VR expertise uh, you know, was, was there, but he wanted me to help kind of co-advise on this thesis project. So that's how Striver started. It was a thesis project to kind of really formally understand how can we use VR to teach, uh, in this case, football players, but obviously a lot of extensibility out to other domains as well of education. So we did that study. Uh, it went well. Der the, the thesis student you know, graduated. His name was Derek. And then Derek, a few months later, decided he was going to start a company based on this idea that we can train people using VR. And, and that's where Striver was born about five years ago. And since then, we've expanded outside of the world of uh, to sports, to other kind of workplace environments, and kind of understanding how we can incorporate VR to help train workforces. And then just, you know, generally this whole idea that, um, you know, the workforce of the future is going to need that constant education, that constant kind of like re-up and reskilling uh, of their abilities. So how does VR fit into all of that? And that's a lot of what we're thinking about these days over at Striver. So hopefully that was a, a decent background in terms of what I'm doing, who I am, and what Striver is all about. And now we can get into some of the, the science of the learning. So if you wanted to go to the next slide. Um, and then this is just a number, a million. So just to give you the scope and scale of what we're doing at Striver. So we've trained now uh, over a million people, which is amazing. So across all of our companies, VR has touched, wow. VR has touched, yeah, VR has touched a million people at this point, which is incredible. Like we didn't even know that was the case. We were just, you know, from a marketing perspective, we were, we were wondering, you know, how many people have we actually trained? So we started going through the data. Um, and of course, you know, there's uh, some of these sessions are kind of some, sometimes the same users, so they're not always completely unique, but we've estimated about a million people and, and growing. Uh, have touched VR, so that's a that's a cool thing for us. It's cool for the VR community as well to know that we're we're able to touch that many folks. Uh, okay, the next slide. Um, and just to give you some brief background on the definitions, uh, you guys can read this immersive technology. Basically, the definition here is, you know, a methodology that combines uh, the sense of presence, what we know to be really kind of engaging about VR, um, the kind of the advanced learning theory. So a lot of what I was doing, looking at how people kind of learn and the science of learning and then data science. Right. So data science is a big part of this. I'll get into the analytics toward the end of the talk uh, and then spatial design, kind of the idea with the kind of first point about presence is how do you actually design space to be uh, kind of an optimal learning environment. So that's when we talk about immersive learning, that's how we're operationalizing it. Okay, next slide. Um, and then of course, I don't, you know, maybe need to sell you guys on the benefits, but this is, you know, what, we're, what we think we're doing in terms of providing benefit to learners. Um, you know, we're going from something that is really pretty basic in terms of what you can do, the computer-based, the lectures, the classrooms, and making it really kind of progressive and, and, and really kind of a one-on-one -on -one coaching, right? And, you know, taking a lot of the, what we know to be good about VR and really kind of embedding that. And that's, that's immersive learning. So you can see, um, you know, things like the, the training right now is sporadic, right? So the training that these folks go through only happens usually one point in time, maybe two points. Uh, what we're offering is kind of the on-demand nature of, of training, which is what VR offers, obviously. And that's something that's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, oftentimes, you know, when you're training in a workplace, you're often competing with other uh, interruptions, right, other distractions. You might not have time to do training that day. There's an emergency that you have to attend to. There's kind of another shift that you now have to do. So all these things kind of prevent you from really accessing training, especially kind of in this centralized way that it's being taught now and decentralizing it and creating the on-demand nature and of course all the other things that we think are good about VR creates a benefit for the learner. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
And again, I'm not probably having to tell you guys on this, but kind of uh, the traditional world of learning and development in workplaces, um, you know, if we look at these two dimensions as the ability to scale the learning and then the learning effectiveness, usually there's a trade off. So traditionally, you don't get to get the scale along with the effectiveness. It's either that gets really effective I and mean, it's one on one coaching really hard to scale or it's really scalable like a computer based training, but sometimes not nearly as effective. And again, our hypothesis is as sure for a lot of you guys, as well as the hypothesis that immersive learning, things like VR are offering the best of both worlds. OK, next slide. Um, and then this is just a nice little anecdote from one of our customers. Um, so we get a lot of kind of just like praise from people who've never even touched VR before. So oftentimes our customers are people who, you know, are using these traditional training mechanisms, um, don't really even know what VR is sometimes. So we introduce it to them and it's kind of, of a cool eye opening experience. So we get a lot of great anecdotal feedback, which I'm sure you guys can really appreciate as well. Um, okay, next slide. Um, just a couple results that I want to go through, because I know for me, data is important. Um, I'm, a, I'm a quantitatively oriented person, so um, you can just read some of the, uh, the benefits that we get here. So groups like Walmart, Fidelity, Verizon, all experience benefit. And when we say benefit, you know, it looks like a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of times from my world, it would kind of look like training effectiveness, right? So in the academic world, how much better are people learning? And that's certainly part of it. But, you know, thinking about increasing engagement and uh, employee confidence in their work and their ability to feel like they can actually succeed at their job by providing them the right kinds of training at the right time is really something that they value. And then training efficiency, right? So being able to actually do this in a cheaper, more scalable, uh, more kind of time effective way is also something that we're finding kind of companies really enjoy and find a benefit for. So when we talk about benefit and effectiveness, don't always limit it to just, you know, the kind of numbers at the end of the day in terms of performance, there's other metrics that are really valuable too uh, that these companies really, really start to value as well. So just to give you a little bit of background on kind of how we're looking at success with our customers. Okay, next slide. Okay, now I'll get into some of the scientific learning principles. And again, this is kind of taking my academic world and figuring out how it can apply to the world of Striver and the world of kind of applied learning and, and kind of workplace settings. And so um, one of the principles, kind of the main principle that I think we're operating under, and this is something that I think is intuitive for everyone and go to the next slide, um, is something uh, basically that is what we're calling perceptual fidelity and perceptual kind of spanning the gamut of all of the different sensory modalities. So vision, touch, uh, audio, um, maybe at some point, olfactory and gustation, right? So tech. So all these kind of senses are really important when you think about uh, the learning behavior. And the reason is a neuroscientific one. And so what I've presented here this kind of weird Jackson Pollock looking thing behind me is actually two neurons. And so this is a this is actually from a research paper that I found uh, looking at how basically two brain cells, two neurons are forming connections, right? And that's what learning is. It's just biologically, it's all these cells forming all these connections in the brain constantly that results in our ability to know stuff, to make decisions effectively, et cetera. And so that's really kind of what we're what we're seeing here live in action and in, in kind of a very you know static graphical form but basically it's these two cells making connections that that's what we're that's what we're aiming to do neuroscientifically when we talk about learning right that's what's happening and so just to play that out in kind of a realistic uh, scenario you can go to the next slide um, in our trainings for example you know what I have presented here is an image of a warehouse right so warehouses are busy places um, they're dangerous places for a lot of our customers and so if you just think about something as simple as not really simple i guess but something as straightforward as safety training right like where you're having to identify workplace hazards where you're having to make sure that boxes are going in the right place that's something that's a kind of a, a really kind of demanding cognitively demanding job and it's like i said it, you know we've done a lot of different types of work that i'll get into but i would say this is a nice example because it's the most straightforward example of what we do when we talk about um, the types of training and why vr is important and so when it comes to perceptual fidelity the idea is we want the environment in vr to match what's happening in the real world that doesn't happen when you're on a computer it certainly doesn't happen when you're in a classroom it happens when you're actually back in the warehouse doing kind of the motions and, and the, going through the cognitive processes of making decisions but that's you know that's something that sometimes companies um, would prefer to have done kind of out of the workplace environment especially if it's dangerous right so we can kind of start to get all the real world consequences and learning 
without having to put someone in that environment. And the reason that's effective and more effective in VR is again, matching the perceptual fidelity. And this goes back to this principle here where we want to basically, if you think about these two neurons in this case as the input, the real world input, and then this neuron is the real world output, this is how the decisions get made, right? Your decisions are basically taking in information from the environment and matching that, connecting with a decision in the kind of real world environment, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna see a safety hazard and I'm gonna go address it, right? So input and output. So similarly, we want these map to, to match. We want these real world inputs to match what's happening here. So we need the same kind of visual stimulation at least, maybe the same auditory stimulation, et cetera. And again, if you're training in a classroom, you're training on a computer, you're not matching those same neurons, right? You're not hitting the same cells that you need to hit in order for that learning to occur. And then similarly on this sense, if you go to the next slide, we want people to make uh, the real world decisions. And so here, this is maybe a decision they have to make about which um, kind of sorting uh, kind of conveyor belt they need to put it down. And so again, you know, I can tell you that I can have you study a pamphlet, but to actually do that, that's the only way that this cell here is going to get stimulated is if I actually have people go through and do the task, actually make the decisions, right? So actually see the real world environment is gonna activate this cell, actually making the decision. And we can do that in VR. Can't really do that any other place, right? And that's what's gonna make the learning better. And that's what's gonna make the learning more transferable. So that's just like a fundamental principle of how the brain works and how the brain operates in order to make sure that um, we're going to make the decisions and we're gonna avoid safety hazards, et cetera. So that's really critical for us is to be able to, again, match that. And, and I'm not kind of saying anything new to you guys. All I'm saying is that there's a kind of like a biological basis, right? For this kind of real world environment. It's not just that we think it works better. It's neuroscientifically the case. And of course the brain is much more complicated than this, but I think the, the principle here is sufficient to describe you know, how we're actually using VR to make better learning and why that's the case from a neuroscientific perspective. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'll go through another principle. This is colloquially what I'm calling depth of processing. And so this basic idea is uh, kind of similar to what I was just describing in terms of perceptual fidelity. But basically the idea is that you want to have kind of greater uh, cognitive processing of information, that greater cognitive processing, for lack of a better term, is going to lead to better retention of learning and better application of the learning. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by depth of processing. So in this instance, I have an example of you trying to learn, say, one of your colleague's dogs. Your colleague tells you, hey, I'm going to bring my dog in tomorrow, and you're going to be like, great, how do I know which one it is? And you know, maybe she proceeds to tell you and describe in words what the dog looks like. And maybe she even sends you a picture over the phone. So this is what you get on your phone. You get an image of this golden doodle here. And in this case, this is actually one of my colleague's dogs. Uh, its name is Golda. Everybody say, hey, Golda. Hey, Golda. Um, so that's Golda the gold, golden doodle. And basically, you know, I get a picture of Golda. I'm like, okay, I can maybe tell from that picture when I go into work the next day what Golda is going to look like. Even better than that, is to get more information about Golda. So if you go to the next slide, um, you're going to see kind of maybe a, maybe she sends you a video of Golda. So now Golda is moving. So that's extra information. That's another level of depth of that processing. So now only you're now not only activating kind of the visual cortex to give you kind of uh, image information, you're activating kind of motion areas of the brain. So there's something called infratemporal cortex, which is kind of up on the side of your brain and that records motion, right? That processes motion. So now you're stimulating more areas of the brain. You're not just getting the image, you're getting the movement. And even better than that, if we go to the next slide, is you know seeing Golda move in her natural environment. So now it's not just a video of Golda, it's a video of Golda kind of interacting with other dogs. And again, it's just a more rich representation of Golda. You're hitting more of those brain areas and we can kind of continue on this path if you just go to the next couple slides. Uh, you could just go to the next, I think, two, one or two. Uh, you can hear Golda, right? So like in this fourth panel, we have Golda barking. So now if you combine the sounds with the audio, you're getting more of a depth of processing, right? So now you're getting a more rich sensory environment being kind of stimulated in your brain. All of that, all of those connections will lead to a representation of Golda that's much more robust than if you just saw the picture or even if your coworker just tried to describe Golda. And then of course, if you can touch Golda and then all the other senses, get all the other senses involved. Like those are better ways to train is to get that depth of processing. Now, how does this relate to VR? Now, of course, 
you can't do all that stuff on a computer, right? You can't necessarily explore objects. You can't see the cause effect relationships. These things matter when we talk about learning concepts is your ability to actually go into environments, touch and kind of feel things as it were in VR. Obviously we can't smell quite yet, <laughs> but even seeing things from different angles and different perspectives, those are creating a more robust image uh, in your brain, basically. It's hitting more of those neurons. And so that's gonna lead to better retention uh, and application of information when you get into the real world because the learning is kind of at a deeper level. The processing is kind of more rich, is more kind of required on the part of the brain. You're gonna then kind of remember things better and you're gonna be able to apply them uh, with more effectiveness, those concepts uh, when you get to the real world. So that's another thing that VR offers. So we wanna make sure that we're not just getting, you know, getting people in VR and showing them like, you know, text kind of, kind of like what we're doing here. Uh, better, than, better than all of this would be to actually have a golden doodle representation for you guys to kind of run around with and touch. So that's to me something that I think um, is really an, an important thing that we're trying to do. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a minute with some of our experiences. Okay, next slide. Um, this isn't actually, when we talk about depth of processing, this is an example from one of our VR experiences. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is just a, obviously a GIF, but this is in the headset um, from a, an unfortunate robbery experience. So some of the retail stores that we work with are experiencing, you know, kind of some on a very rare occasion, uh, a store robbery. It doesn't happen often, but it obviously happens. And even though it's a rare event, it's a very dangerous event. And so being able to prepare employees is critical because if they don't do the right things, it could end disastrously, right? And the way that this is currently taught is through a pamphlet, through classroom training, right? They're kind of supposed to memorize the steps. They may even go like walk, do a walkthrough with their manager, but by no sense are they getting kind of like the same pressure, the same person kind of yelling. And if you guys could actually experience this, um, you would you would understand, and, and maybe there's even some stuff online I can share with you just in a 2D format, but once you're in 3D, it's really kind of a very visceral experience. Someone's yelling at you to do this, someone's telling you to go do this, and, and you're kind of having to kind of do all of that, follow protocol without actually angering people, right? So the, the robbers in this case, you don't want to kind of do the wrong thing because that's going to lead to a much worse outcome. And so being able to actually build in that depth of processing to feel the same kind of effective emotional response to really see what the robber looks like as they're passing through, maybe to have a gun even kind of waved in your face is, you know, and we, and, and by the way, just to, you know, kind of throw it out there, we make sure that and we work with the subject matter experts with our companies to make sure that we're not doing anything that's obviously overtly triggering or kind of too emotionally um, uh, kind of provoking. And, and we, we allow people to opt out of it. But for those that do feel like this is something that they could benefit from and are not necessarily going to feel the, you know, the, the kind of triggered environment that they may, that other people may, this is a really beneficial experience for them. And so that's something that we're doing to kind of build in that depth of processing. Uh, in this case, we're using, a, you can obviously tell 360 uh, kind of spherical video to do that because that realistic photorealism in that case is really important. Um, and to get that kind of perspective of seeing kind of people walk and move as they would in the real world, yell at you as they would in the real world. That's something that's really important that we build into our VR experiences. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so another principle here, uh, and a final one that I'll talk about is just a, a simply attention and engagement, again, kind of the colloquial term, um, from a biological perspective, we often think of this as physiological arousal and vigilance. And so these are kind of really well studied, uh, phenomena in terms of the kind of cognitive neuroscience literature and the basic principle here, obviously, uh, nothing new for you guys, but just, you know, as it's kind of been formalized in the scientific literature is that you want to engage people with an optimal level of arousal. And that's not just kind of a, an abstract cognitive construct. It's something that exists physiologically. And so there's a whole kind of host of things that happen when your environment is sufficiently stimulating you and you're sufficiently engaged. There's a lot of physiological kind of consequences to that. One of them being your neurotransmitters are increased in certain areas of the brain, making you more receptive and more likely to take in information and remember that information. Now, you don't want to overstimulate someone, right? You're going to distract them and, and induce, you know, great cognitive loads. So we don't want to do that. So that we're always trying to find that optimal level of arousal. And if you think about learning, you know, mediums that happen through pamphlets or, or we've all been in classrooms, <laughs> passive instruction, not too unlike maybe uh, what's going on here, but at least in the VR environment, environment, this is better than Zoom, right? So that you're actually kind of engaged, you can kind of see me move, et cetera. Even better is for you to have that hands-on learning that VR offers. So that level of just like interaction, 
the fact that you're just generally invoking your motor system is creating a set of physiological consequences in your body that will allow you to perceive information better. It will allow you to information process better, and it will allow you to consolidate memories and kind of when we talk about the neural kind of strengthening of the of the cells when you're learning, all that stuff is enhanced when you're at a certain level of physiological arousal. So just being engaged in your environment, having to look around and move is critical for that learning. And so that's basically the principle that we're working under. And then the next slide um, just basically reiterates that. Um, you can see the next slide, hopefully. Yeah, so this is actually over 100 years old, this result. This is pretty cool. It's uh, from, from a pretty seminal study, Yerkes and Dotson, showing this, uh, what they call um, this you know, kind of optimal level of arousal. I mean, you can see on these two axes here, we have performance. And in this case, we're just calling this cognitive engagement, but there's a lot of words we could use here. But this is, a, this is meant to be not a, just an abstract construct, this cognitive engagement. It's actually a physiological one. And so measured by things like cortisol levels, measured by now we can actually measure neurotransmitter concentrations in the body, et cetera. So you can see when there's kind of an optimal level, it's not too much, it's not too little, it's kind of right in the middle there, um, you're going to get performance increases. And this has been shown time and time again. I, I put the original study here just to emphasize the fact that we've known about this for a long time, and these results generally have been replicated over and over again. Um, now, the optimal level of arousal is going to change for different types of training. And so what we're doing at Striver is we're always trying to kind of figure out what the optimal level of arousal is through a variety of means. Um, I think for us that the best case scenario is to be able to have that optimal level of arousal um, come from a physiological perspective, right? So that we're actually um, being able to really measure things like, you know, EEG is actually a great Sorry, example. Sorry, I've jumped to the wrong oh, it's okay. slide right now. <laughs> it's, I... okay. it's okay. There you go. Sorry. I'll, no, it's okay. I'll keep talking. Um, so like EEG, I, I've been talking to a few folks now who've been manufacturing headsets that can record brain waves. And so it's through these brain waves that we can tell like how engaged, how optimal levels of arousal are actually being produced by VR. So it's kind of cool to think about now blending those two worlds of, you know, VR headset manufacturing content creation along with the kind of simultaneous physiological data that we can capture. And that's really cool because again, although we don't know for any given experience exactly what the optimal level of arousal is, we can figure that out by just collecting the right kinds of data. And that world seems to be coming pretty fast, which is exciting for me so that we can get a little bit more objective and make more stronger kind of prescriptions and predictions about what is the right kind of content to present? What's the right content that's going to actually be optimal for learning, et cetera? So that's kind of a cool new world that's coming. And again, uh, happy to talk more in depth about some of that work, uh, but just to give you a preview of uh, and a high level summation of what that world looks like. Um, and I think that's a nice segue if we go to the next slide. Um, and then, you know, just to reiterate, I won't go through the the Verizon bit again, but that, but you know, you can imagine that you're really engaged when you're kind of being robbed at gunpoint in VR. So just to reemphasize that, and then uh, again, a nice segue. And if we go to the next slide, into uh, what we're what, what I think is really kind of one of the most interesting things about the VR training that we're doing, which is the data analytics and the insights that we can get. Um, and so basically, um, for us. Uh, we are able to get data for the first time that are, is really not able to be gotten by um, almost anyone else, right, in any other learning situation. So the immersive data, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second, is giving us really cool new insights that we haven't been able to glean uh, in any other way before. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in the next slide. Um, so this is a, maybe a really kind of pretty boring, straightforward training clip from one of our training experiences. You guys can see up here just a little GIF that we recorded. And the thing I want you to take away from this is that, you know, obviously the thing that is different about VR settings than other traditional, one of the things that's different about VR settings than other traditional classroom settings is your ability to kind of explore your environment. So if I'm learning kind of similar things that are being displayed here and I'm learning that on a computer, I'm really limited in how I can actually explore my environment. I probably have to drag a mouse or you know, use keystrokes to actually get around the environment, which is really unnatural. And so the way that I'm gonna explore the environment is very different spatially, right? From then what I'm gonna do in VR, which is much more natural. I can look at Daniel, I can look at you guys, seamlessly, very much consistent with what I do in the real world. The reason that's important is because where you choose to focus your spatial attention tells us a lot 
about what you know, what kind of confidence you have. Are you familiar with the environment? So these are things that we can start to make infer strong inferences around how good people are at the different skills and provide them follow-on training if we think they're uh, needing that uh, in certain cases. And then, so if we go to the next slide, um, just generally, the the, what, we, what we're basically collecting a lot of in, in many of these instances is head tracking data, right? So a lot of these, all the headsets right now output um, kind of your, your six degrees of freedom if it's a six soft device or three degrees of freedom, and they're doing it at a high sample rate. So you're doing it maybe 20, 60 times uh, a second. So you're getting positional data from someone 20 times a second which is a lot or even you know greater than that 60 times a second 90 times a second potentially in some cases and when you get all that data and you kind of plot it on what the vr environment looks like so this is just in basically a plot of all the head tracking data points over like five minutes um onto an over an unwrapped 360 image right so if we just want to plot and see where are people looking this is what you're going to get. It looks like a big kind of swarm of blue bees, right? Like not very informative. Uh, what are you going to do with that information? And so what we've done at Strivers, we try to make all that head tracking data really useful and informative to be able to tell us something about how learners are learning. And so what we basically do is we start to take all of this data, which is every head tracking data point from someone over a five minute period in their VR environment, and we reduce it. So if you go to the next slide, we reduce that down to um, just a few kind of more or at least a fraction of those data points, which is a little bit more interesting. Um, can you go to the next slide? Technical difficulties. Is that showing for you? Because I see the third oh, I don't, image oh. now. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't see anything. <laughs> but if you guys can ah. see it, I can I can walk you through it. Um, so I don't see okay. anything. But but I'm assuming you guys can see uh, you guys can see things. Um, so basically, uh, what we're showing is wait a minute. Uh, that that looks the emojis there look like they're not seeing it either. Okay. Um, Laurel, do you have some advice on? Uh, shall we reset the browser and start again? If people aren't seeing it. Um, what do you okay. Yes, you need to set the link right. in again a second time. Just set it in again Wait. and hit enter, and they should see it. Uh, the link, I don't have the link myself. Um, can I reset the browser and try it like that, or do I, I actually I have to? I just did. I just did. Okay. Now, do, can people see it now? Smiley's, if you see it? No. Nope. No? Let me go back. <laughs> okay, you need to paste in the link again. Okay. Where will I get that quickly? Uh, the link. Uh, Donna, do you have the link? Sorry about um, this, no. Michael. It does I happen no, it's, sometimes. No, it's all good. Um, <laughs> I'm looking. Sorry. Right. Okay. So that's not that one. Um, I, can, I can also resend it if it's helpful. Possibly. I'm just looking no. where to type it in as well. You mean does it. it have to be put I have it. it. Oh, you got Hold it. On. Thank you. Yep. Thank Hold you, Laurel. On. Okay. Okay. Laurel to the Sorry, rescue. Got it. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Also okay, helps Laurel's in 2D. She can copy and paste into the into the situation. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. When you're in a headset presenting, you don't have that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering yet. about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Nope. There's no well, I need to reset the space. So everybody hold on. Okay. Reset. Everybody hold on. We're going to go black and come back in, and that should reset Blue. the space. Just two seconds. So I'm going to jump through the slides again. Everyone seeing the slides jump? Can you see Give him? us some smileys if you're seeing a jump. That's better. Yay. Okay, so I'll okay. jump ahead to where we got to. Little glitch in the matrix there. It's nice that you can reset this so easily. Yeah, and then it would be the next slide after this. Huh. You don't Maybe see this again? No, I don't see what it. About, you... What about... Yeah, we can just go here. This one? This is fine. We can go here. Yeah, that's fine. This I is can better. See this okay, one. then it was just the one slide. So, it's okay. Unfortunately, um, and I'll check the, uh, the slides. And this, you know, it's possible that there's a technical issue on my end too. But basically, what we're doing with that head tracking data, you saw that kind of swarm of bees, right? And that's something that is not very useful to us. So, what we want to do is we want to take that data 
and make it only relevant for the kind of head tracking kind of behaviors that we care about. So where are people inspecting? Where are people spending their time? So we can look at the difference between like what we call a fixation and someone who's just kind of making a, a sweep through the space. And so once we kind of start to filter that out smartly with our algorithms, we can then also see where are most people spending their time were they inspecting? That tells us not only about what they know, that tells us a little bit about the space itself and the environment. If it's a useful kind of training environment and if we need to start shifting things around content wise, et cetera. Um, we can also dynamically look at head tracking data. So this is from that same robbery experience. And I use that robbery experience, not because we do that often, but just because it's easy, I think, for everybody to understand. And effectively what we're showing here is the ability to look at head tracking data over a period of time. And this is from a lot of users. So this is no longer just from one person. This is where people looking over like a three second period. And in this part of the experience, the robber here is basically telling you, don't look at me. And this is something that happens often. And there are actually instructions in the training that tell you don't look like, just follow what the robber says, don't look at them. And in fact, we asked them in a multiple choice format, what do you do if the robber says, don't look at you, right? Just very simple, kind of like that. Everybody's like, oh, well, follow what the robber says, don't look at them. Well, a lot of those same people who look at their head tracking data actually stay on the robber. So you can see people's head tracking data, about half of them break away and look away from the robber, and about half of them stay. They're actually not following instructions. Maybe they're you know, paralyzed with fear, right? This is not something that is they're used to, or they're kind of trying to kind of orient themselves to what he's saying and what some one of the other robbers is saying and one of their coworkers is saying. So they're trying to take in all this information. And so for you, um, and you know, this could apply obviously outside of a robbery situation. So for you to be able to stay calm, for you to you to be able to kind of know what to focus on, know what not to focus on, et cetera, that's really important. And so this is an instance where we can actually see how do people's kind of you know, head tracking data tell us about what they truly know and how they're truly going to behave once they're in that environment. There's much more innocuous, um, you know, instances of this as well, where it's not robbery, where you're just looking at safety hazards, but even like knowing where you look, is it the right place in space? We have other customer work where we're looking at um, how people are interacting with customers, right? So do you know when to approach a customer or something as simple as that? That's something that we can do also just by looking at kind of the head tracking data. And again, like generally, do you know the space? Are you confident with where the concepts are gonna be located if it's a spatial kind of oriented concept, et cetera. And so that's a unique insight that we can get. Um, and then, you know, we can go uh, even further than that with a lot of the, what we're calling kind of soft skills or social skills, right? So I mentioned this work I was doing a while ago looking at developing social skills games for, for children with high-functioning autism. Well, it turns out, you know, everyone needs, you know, to some extent and could use and can benefit from um, kind of, you know, soft skills or social skills interactions. And so we're working with a lot of companies now for like manager training, for example. So how do you actually have a difficult conversation with a coworker? How do you know when, you know, things are kind of like not great at the workplace because someone is engaging in kind of bias or discriminatory behavior. And then once we can recognize that, we can actually have them, basically those same people in that environment, recognize that better and be able to deal with it, right? It's not just the recognition of the kind of acts that need to be addressed in the workplace, but it's how do you have that discussion? And so VR offers an environment which you can practice. And so then the data analytics get really interesting, right? We're not just looking at where people are looking. Maybe we're looking at other nonverbal behaviors. We can actually capture speech now. So we have the ability to like basically listen uh, to what someone's saying and then automatically start to code that information, looking for things like positive versus negative sentiment. We can look at their comfort in the situation, right? So now you think about even incorporating all the other physiological data that I was mentioning earlier, all that stuff becomes really powerful to tell someone about, you know, are you, do you really feel comfortable in this conversation? How are you gonna be able to do this out in the world? And we can give them, you know, more structured feedback as to whether or not that interact, that social interaction was something that was good or was something that needed to be improved on before they go out into the real world and maybe something, you know, kind of bad happens in the workplace, et cetera. And this isn't obviously just in the workplace, this is everywhere, right? Everybody is always socially interacting, right? In the classroom, et cetera teachers and students. So the, a lot of that work that we're doing now is very applicable uh, to other types of social skills. So that's something I'm really excited about. It's something that we're just starting now. So it's not something that we're um, kind of productionalizing at this point. Um, but basically, uh, but basically that's kind of what we're doing. And that's, that's something that I think is really exciting about um, where we are uh, with these data and analytics that we can get from, from VR. Okay. And I think just the takeaway slide. Uh, so just to wrap up, 
Um, you know, basically, if, if there's anything you guys take away from the slide is obviously, uh, you know, what we think is kind of preaching the choir here. Um, technologies like VR are really best positioned to take advantage of all of the kind of scientific principles. So, you know, I mentioned a few of those. There's a host of these and there's a lot more to talk about with even the ones that I presented. But the idea basically here is VR uh, and tools like VR are uniquely positioned to take advantage of these principles. We've known for some time, you know, ways to optimize learning environments. We have not been able to get into doing that and the application of it because it's really resource intensive when you think about doing it in a classroom, et cetera, or the one-on-one -on -one coaching in the workplace. Well, VR, we can do that now. It's easy. It's a lot easier to create content. The headsets are relatively cheap in price now, and there's a ton of people developing cool content and really leveraging that, those, those kind of best things, ways to engage folks in VR and create cool simulations and other VR environments that we're ready, I think, to start to take advantage of that. And we're seeing that happen even a little bit with some of the customer work that we're doing now. So that's pretty exciting to me. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the second takeaway here is that we have a methodology, right? So we're not just creating VR for the sake of VR, even though it is cool and engaging, there needs to be some kind of scientific kind of backing or benefit behind it. And so we can learn and use what, what from all the different research that's been out there for now decades, uh, but we're also going to learn ourselves. So companies like ours and, and a lot of other people who are doing incredible work, you know, looking at you know, applications of these technologies in the classroom, et cetera, this is a unique data collection opportunity for us to really understand and learn about how these technologies are actually working for people who need it, right? Not just other VR enthusiasts, but for the world of people who haven't really touched VR before, how is this actually going to work for them? And so we have, we're kind of at a unique point here where we're seeing the proliferation of headsets. And now we want to see and really understand from a formal perspective, how to best employ and engage people using this technology so that they're not just saying, oh, that was cool, but they're actually learning something. They're at, they want to go back because they felt like it was effective for them in the real world. Um, so those are kind of a couple of key takeaways that I wanted to make sure you guys got. Um, and the next slide. Uh, so if you guys want to follow up, we do have a couple of resources online. We've written a few white papers and we have a couple of guides. Um, I basically go into detail on a lot of these principles. If you guys want to check out the stuff on the website, uh, the science of learning. And then there's another one that we just put out on the next slide, which is kind of cool. Um, and this is something called, we're calling the ultimate guide. It's, you know, it's a little ambitious to say it's the ultimate guide, but it's meant to be denote like that comprehensively we started to put a lot of these principles together not just from the learning perspective but also just from like the content creation and how do we actually work with folks to create good impactful learning experiences not just something that's cool for vr but something that's going to work and that people feel like they're going to benefit from uh so that's all i have uh, i think we're probably right at time anyway if not a little bit over so i really appreciate your guys' time um, this has been a cool experience for me. I'm glad I got to do this. And uh, and thanks for kind of being such a good, attentive audience. Um, and I guess now we'll do some Q&A. Fantastic. Yeah, well, fantastic. Everybody give it up for Michael and Striver. That was uh, deeply illuminating. And I'm going to hog your time a little bit before I hand over your precious time to our guides. I have one or two questions myself. So first of all, I really appreciate the obviously <clears throat> the depth of research that you're going into with uh, Striver and how with your white papers and other work that benefits the whole industry. And I mean, us here, a lot of us here are educators or teachers or trainers, and I consider myself an evangelist, unashamedly so, um, but it's easy to fall into the trap of just, I have a hunch that this is cool and it's going to work. Um, and having sound research to back it up when you approach decision makers, management, investors, and so on is crucial. So um, thank you. Thank you for that side of things. Um, I wondered about just a quick question, that swarm of bees. Uh, obviously, that kind of data is critical for really nailing, fine tuning down the effectiveness, efficiency of what you're doing. Was that head tracking or eye tracking? And will you be working with eye tracking? Yeah, that's a great question. So that was head tracking data. And one of the kind of, you know, things that we're obviously really aware of is that the head is, you know, basically a proxy in some cases for the eyes, but in some cases yeah. it's not, right? It really depends on what you're looking at, how you're interacting yeah. with the world, how far away yeah. something is in the virtual space. So we do, we are we have started working with head tra uh, eye tracking a little bit. So there's obviously a lot of head headset manufacturers who started to incorporate yeah. natively eye tracking exactly. to their devices. It's not at the point where we're ready to scale it, but we've started to explore like the Pico device, for example, okay. 
uh, yeah, has yeah. native they, they bought Great. toby or they have toby integrated and so yeah uh, and we know and we know from the kind of world of research that that eye tracking is going to be more informative for some instances in terms Makes of, sense, kind of yeah. what people know and where they're kind of paying attention and that helps us okay. not just understand what they know but how to develop content Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I am going to hand over now. Uh, and before I do that, to explain for those of you who don't know, I am going to uh, switch on audio, uh, audience participation. You should now have the ability to raise your hand. If you look down to your bottom right, you should be raise hand. If you have a question for Michael or anything, uh, please use the raise hand function that will appear on my panel of people who want to speak. Uh, including Steven Sato, uh, quick off the mark there. Steven, uh, you should have uh, audio hey. now. Where are you? Let us know where you are. Right here. There's a way. I think I, I think I see Steve. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Right, great. So, yeah, please, what's your question? <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate it. Just wanted to say a uh, big shout out to uh, you guys publishing Rise Mag. Rise Magazine also, too, really informative with a lot of the data that you guys have collected and metrics that for us as practitioners and users uh, is really valuable uh, for, for us to sort of uh, help persuade uh, some of our stakeholders. So thank you for that as well. Great presentation. Loved it. Um, and can't wait for, the, for more from, from Striver. Yeah. yeah thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Next, we're going to go to um, Oscar. Oscar, you should any minute have yeah let us know where you are give us some emojis in the green there or you give us a wave that's great yeah okay what's your question oscar yeah thank you for that uh, presentation that was uh, really interesting um we have seen uh, different kind of uh, advantages of these kind of immersive learning experiences but i was wondering what do the customer used to look for when they're asking for uh, performance uh, effectiveness it's a great question. So a lot of our customers are obviously used to dealing with um, data that's really coming from traditional learning and development technologies. And so a lot of this is computer based or even, you know, uh, informal or even formal observational assessments. Following someone on the job or multiple choice questions on a piece of paper, et cetera, or on a computer. Um, because that's what they know, that's typically what they ask for. So it, it's actually been a, a really interesting journey for us because for me, it was pretty uh, apparent what the power of this technology could provide in terms of data and analytics. But what I quickly realized was our customers were, there was a gap, right? And what they were used to dealing with. And so they were asking for things like, well, how many did they get correct on a multiple choice? And I'm basically saying like, well, it's not just about multiple choice question, you can combine that with, you know, how many times they needed to look at something before they actually were able to make a decision about it or select, et cetera. So a lot of these more nuanced, uh, I think, insightful metrics. And so it's been a journey to kind of educate our customers to say, like, you know, it's not just all about, you know, some kind of uh, text-based choice data, but it's about how they're behaving and the kind of unique ways we can measure behavior in VR. And so initially, our customers would typically ask for the things like the traditional multiple choice question accuracy. But they, uh, yeah. over time, over the next so it's, it's, it's the dynamic thing. So that what they prefer for in the beginning versus what they prefer kind of uh, six months or a year in, it becomes very different this, because they start to understand that there's more power in that data. It reminds me of that scene in Star Wars. This is not the assessment you are looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> excellent. Thank you for that. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. Let's thank see you. who we got. Uh, thank you, Oscar, for that. Uh, Yoshinoya, um, you should have a mic now let us know where you are yoshinoya please where are you give us a wave give us some emojis where are you yoshinoya uh oh yeah right there the bot here on my right okay yeah what's your question please hey guys can you hear me yes, yes. great um well my initial question you the host already asked which was around headset tracking versus eye tracking uh, i'm just mm -hmm. curious just to add on to that um how do you guys define um, when eye tracking is scalable? Because I know it is a work in progress. There are some headsets that have eye tracking, but to what point when you say, okay, this headset quality for eye tracking is at where it needs to be, then we'll start adopting it. Just curious on where your criteria in evaluating that is. Yeah, that's a great mm -hmm. question. So I would say that 
um, from our experience working with the Toby device for the last few years, the quality is certainly there. And I would even say the kind of user experience is definitely there, despite the calibration, et cetera. Um, and then they've even integrated it pretty seamlessly into the into the Pico headset and other headsets obviously have this. When I So when you think about scalability, those are interesting and useful things to consider. But for us, it's a lot about how are we able to even just ingest all that data, host it, and then do something interesting analytically with it as well. Yeah. And so scalability is really kind of, I would say a lot on our side as well, how prepared we are to take that data on. Um, it's not necessarily the case that, you know, we couldn't tomorrow, if, if our customers were willing, give them a headset, like say that one of the, the Pico Neo 2, and they, let's say it had eye tracking incorporated in that, we turned that on, we would just have this stream of data that, you know, would basically be as effective as that kind of swarm of bees, right, that I showed you, because we haven't really delved into the level of kind of scalability that we need to, to know that automatically we can generate these insights from eye tracking data, et cetera. So our, right. our data science team is actually working a lot on building that infrastructure and that scalability. So at this point, it's probably a lot less to do with the, the headsets themselves or even deploying them. It's more about like, how do we host that data? How do we actually do something meaningful with that data uh, for yeah. scale? And six months ago, that I don't think sense. that was the case. I don't think, I don't think, had, I don't think the manufac some manufacturers were producing enough devices even for us to have the ability to put them out. Because, you know, you saw that number of a million folks. What that results in is tens of thousands of headsets for us, right? We're like a huge yeah. demand for Oculus in terms of their business and, and headset deployment. That's becoming less the case, which is great that other people are adopting it, but they don't know how to necessarily keep it. So same thing with the Pico folks over in China. They're, they're trying to figure out, you know, is this something that needs to be scaled? How many headsets are going to be needed, yeah. et cetera? Yeah. They need to have the demand for the eye tracking to really scale that side of things up. Exactly. Understood. Okay. Well, wow, great questions. Lovely. Um, thank you, Yoshinoya. Uh, saved for life. Saved for life? Yes. One second. Uh, I think saved for life is in the purple avatar, kind of second step up there. Yep. Uh, purple robot yes. avatar. Yeah. Hi. Can, can you hear me? Can yeah, I can hear you well. Oh, okay. I think I don't have to do this too good. Um, I have had a TBI, so I get very confused. Um, and and I want to. Uh, I I teamed up with some people to um at a VR place. We're gonna start doing learning and education. I also have a daughter who's on the autism spectrum. And that's why I wanted to do this. So um, what what I want to know is, is there an email address I could write to you or some? I, sure. Yep. I, I, and I don't get this. <laughs> and, and for anyone that's interested, I'm happy to give out my email. I should have thrown it up on the on the screen here but if i don't know if you guys can you guys can write it or daniel it's, you, i mean you've, you've, you guys have promoted as well Absolutely, but it's uh, yeah. it's casali so it's my last name it's uh c-a-s-a-l-e at striver s-t-r-i-v-r dot com and i think you can go to the educators in vr um you know mm. social website so it's just my last name um so striver. michael casali yeah casali yeah okay casali well. um yeah so, if you've Find the website. Can I just add to that also oh, sure. um, okay. on the topic of uh, autism? We actually have, uh, as educators in VR, we have different kind of projects uh, and around which we run different events. So, for example, we have a language VR project. We have a <laughs> autism and uh, yeah, autism and um, I think uh, additional learning needs project where we run events every now and again so please feel free also to join our discord server there's a whole kind of subgroup of people there discussing and sharing resources and links on that um on that uh, topic and then i know that one of our members has set up specifically on facebook i think vr for autism uh facebook group i think as well so please you know uh, there are people working in this area and uh, have a look and join you'll find you'll find some good resources there yeah i i kind of did but i okay. i'm too confused i see i understand uh, I yeah just think well, like this. yeah <laughs> please also email michael and uh, i'm sure yeah, you can put okay. you in touch with some more resources all right sure. thank you Absolutely. thank you very much thank you who oh. else have we got we've got one more question here john trav john trav 
you want. Uh, let me just see if your mic went on yet. Where's John Trav? Can you let us know where you are? In the green and blue avatar kind of central there. Hi there. What's your question, John Trav? Do we not have audio with you? I can't hear you, John Trav. I can see you, but I can't see your... Yeah, you have to accept, unmute yourself maybe, is that it? And see if you're, you're not muted, I don't think. Let me see if I try again. Um, okay, try that again, John Trav. No, Hello, everybody. Hi, Hello. yes, better. Hi, one, we can hear two, you. One, two. Yeah, mic check. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, listen, uh, I kind of missed part of the the presentation, so I was wondering if you could give a little <clears throat> background story on it, you know, and what I missed, because I got here not that long ago. That's that's nice of you to ask that, John Trav. I'm not sure we're going to go back over what we've just done, but I will say that on YouTube, Ooh. we've streamed this and we've recorded this. So this is available again for you to watch in your own leisure. Is that uh -huh. okay? Yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, mm -hmm. but, okay. But, um, so now what's going on? Is the presentation done? Yeah, so we just gonna, had a presentation from Michael. We're just asking questions. And, yeah, the people who watch the presentation, they have questions about what, uh, what uh, Michael shared with us. So when you're uh -huh. ready, you know, find the YouTube channel, find the video, it's up there, and then you can, uh, you can watch and listen to the questions as well. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, perfect. Sounds good. Right, lovely. We have another question. Thank you for that, John Trav. Let's see. Bartosz, yes, I saw a question of yours. It disappeared, and you're back again. Bartosz, I think, in the front here. Um, yes, I'm here. I hope you can hear me. I had some audio problems. Fantastic. Yes, yes please, Bartosz. Over to uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask more about the research side of, of your work. Uh, you've talked about uh, eye and head tracking, uh, but you've also mentioned like EEG and cortisol level. And from your experience, uh, what is the most useful method uh, for the for measuring the the performance of the learning process considering how unobstructive the measure can be yeah that's an excellent question i don't know if i have a great <laughs> one answer for that but um, i'll try to give it a shot so I'll, I'll i'll start by not answering it and say that there's probably a lot <laughs> okay. of context a lot of context dependency right so um, depending on what kind of performance you're wanting to look at there's probably different measures i think ultimately um, you know, and what we preach, and I think something that's intuitive is just to be able to put people in as much of a kind of a real world scenario as possible and let them interact. And that a lot of it is dependent on obviously the, the kind of free form nature of the environment you build. So how open the world is, is then you can start to measure things that are a little bit more interesting. So for example, if we want to know and I just gave that warehouse example of you not having to know like how to take boxes and kind of pick them up and look at the barcodes and send them down the right scanner. I can ask you a series of kind of text-based questions, but that doesn't really tell me that you know what to do once you go back in that room and have to deal with the boxes. And that's a really mundane example, but I think it's an easy one for everybody to get. And so better than that is to say, okay, I'm just gonna put you in the room. What do you do first? And then, then you just kind of go because how you start to string together even decisions is important. So ideally we can get environments where we can create those very kind of like custom metrics, right? To say, okay, I'm gonna wait till they grab the box and that's one kind of thing that I'm looking for. I'm looking for, do they, find the label right away or do they fumble around with the box do they know the right place to put the box after that so all these kind of things i would be measuring right and then come up with maybe a total score and i could even drill into the different parts of that process so that i can give them some sort of adaptive training on a subsequent experience um, what we typically though have is you know not that and what we typically do is we want to create kind of you know measures that try to scale and so there are a lot of interesting kind of work being done with like say eeg data that i mentioned and oh that's great um eeg tells us a lot about like you know how do people know when a mistake is being made you don't need to actually see them perform what will happen is uh in the brain there's something called an error related negativity signal and that can be used to say okay 
that person doesn't quite think that that belongs there. They don't have to tell me that, they don't even have to show me that. So it would be nice to have is these automated, automated ways to measure that. And I don't think that there's any one kind of metric that would stand out on its own other than show me that you know how to do the thing. Show me that you know how to you know, put the boxes in the right place if that's the task. So that's yeah. the problem is that we were dealing with a lot of kind of variability there. But that said, when I talk about like head tracking or like I just mentioned with the EEG, with other kind of physiological markers, there are kind of yeah. really interesting research studies that have shown that independent of the task being performed, there's kind of these optimal levels of, of kind of physiological signals, right? So the EEG signal from the alpha wave, I'm making this up, but like the EEG signal from the alpha wave is like at a certain kind of peak, you know, hertz, you know, whatever the cycle is, right, of that particular wave. And that's like happening you know, again and again as you're performing the task or it's improving, et cetera. So those kind of things are interesting. They're definitely research and they're, they really haven't made it out. And that's something that we would want to test before we use yeah. it. But we're doing something similar with even head tracking to say like, are you, are you having to look at kind of things four and five times before you know that you're supposed to be looking at them? Because if you do, yeah. that's probably not as good as someone who knows right away to just go right there, they see it and they know how to make a decision about it. So. While there is task dependency, we're trying to figure out if there are these scalable metrics. Some of them are going to be yeah. head and eye tracking. Some of them are going to be a little bit more complicated. But ideal yeah. state is just to like actually have them perform the, the task that they need to, which is going to look different for the different training situations. So that's yeah. not so my answer is there's not one kind of universal okay. metric, but 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 we're on a path to figuring out like there might be some metrics that do kind of correspond to performance across independent of that. Well, we haven't quite yeah. found any that that we would use that scale at this moment. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you very Could much, Could I Michael. go with one small? Um, uh, Bartosz, you wanted another question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Just if before, I, if just I before can. You, you can. I will let you ask just one second. Um, I think we'll make this the last question. And then um, after that, I'm going to invite everybody, uh, just a couple of a couple of announcements and then I'll invite everybody to make their way outside and we can spread out. We're going to turn the megaphones off everybody's microphones on so you can go mingle spread out have conversations without being interfered by other people around you but let's have one more very quick question bartosh and quick answer yes, and then we'll move on quick. outside thank you thank you very much for the opportunity i wanted to ask yeah. uh, have you encountered the problems with people who for example were uh, very stressed or very uncomfortable with the vr due to for example how untechnological they are or to the eye problems or any other and how you overcome those if you find those problems yeah, we do, we it's rare. I would say it happens probably less than five percent of the time, probably more like one percent of the time. But there are people who are uncomfortable with the headset, maybe the glasses. You know, they're not quite comfortable, um, or the experience itself. You know, some people experience motion sickness, and so we let those people opt out of it. I don't think there's yeah. a great solution for that quite yet with the uh, with the headsets that are available right now. Okay, thank you so thank much, you Michael. Much. Uh, sure. Thank you, Bartosz, yes, for your question. So just before um, we go out, if you, everybody, and this is for, in particular, for Save for Life, but everybody behind you, our uh, resident wizard, Mark, here, has put up Michael's email on the back wall. So if you have a turn around and look at the back wall, that's Michael's email at uh, kazale at striver.com. Thank you for that, Mark. And uh, you'll be able to reach him there. Um, Couple of other things. Uh, we have ongoing events as educators in VR. We always have fresh guests and fresh workshops, some workshops to repeat. Please check out our Altspace uh, VR channel for upcoming events. Also, feel free to join the Discord server for more conversation in between events or the Educators of VR Facebook group. Um, we also are running, and we I don't know if anybody here saw, uh, give me some claps if you heard about the students in VR project we were working on. I can see Jan Stahlberg there. He was, uh, yeah, lovely. Um, he was involved in that. Thank you for that, Jan. Um, so if you are attached to any students or educational uh, institutions, we're working a project where we're bringing students up, mentoring them to give presentations, to organize events. If you're interested in that, please find us, educators in VR. Um, you can be involved in our upcoming projects. And I think with that, um, anything else? Anything else? Well, we, we've partnered up with the iLearn. We're helping them uh, put on their iLearn Vision 2020 conference. I know there's still cheap tickets and uh, uh, proposals. Deadline is coming up if you have anything interesting to submit there. 
And then in the fall, we don't have the details yet, but there are some very, very exciting uh, events coming up there as well. So with that, I am going to um, go off microphone, off megaphone. I'm going to free up your uh, microphones. And then everybody, when you're ready, make your way. You have microphones now. I'm going off megaphone. We're going to go outside, spread out, meet somebody, mingle, and network. See you outside. Thank you. Oh, and thank you so much, Michael. Give it up one more time for Michael. Sure. Please, everybody, Thanks, big round of applause. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, yeah. Guys. Big round of appreciation. Excellent. All right, there we go. Okay. Hi, Mike. Very cool. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that that was. Um, more it was easier than i thought it was going to be um you know obviously getting used to <laughs> even presenting but, 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 that modality, but hopefully that was good for hopefully that was useful information i don't know if oh yeah I mean... Próbowałem, próbowałem też to nagrywać w tle, ale musiałem ostatecznie przerwać, bo, bo program do nagrywania mi nie pozwalał mówić przez mikrofon, dlatego musiałem od, odkliknąć pytanie i, i potem, potem jeszcze, jeszcze raz. Ale no, znaczy no, spodziewałem się, że będzie bardziej, bardziej, że tak powiem, e, to powiedzieć, więc tak, tak, więcej mięsa trochę takiego od, od strony badawczej, ale nie było tak dość szczególnie. Ja myślę, że to nie są, nie są jakby do przywiązania zwierzęcia, dla, dla, dla osób, które są popularne scenariusz. No, prawdopodobnie masz rację. Ale się trochę naprawiłem, jak zobaczyłem, wiesz, biogram tego, tego gościa tam na tym, tym gdzie on faktycznie z tym zajmuje strony badawcze, a to myślałem, myślałem, że będzie bardziej. Publikacje to pewnie pisze tak niezłe, nie? Ja nie pisałem, ale... Ale tak tutaj dla, dla ludzi to... Jesteś? Halo? Jesteś? Wyciszyło mnie, sorry. O, wyciszyło cię. Ja mówię, że zawsze jest to, jest to jakiś adres, gdzie można pisać i ewentualnie o coś podpytać, no. albo można wyszukać no. w bazie publikacji po jego nazwisku i zobaczyć faktycznie, co tam, co tam się no. działo i co ciekawego publikowali. Ale jest, jest, no, dobra. Natomiast to cały czas mnie bawi to, ile mają problemów z synchronizacją i, i poprowadzeniem prezentacji, nie nawet kiedy masz czołowe osoby tutaj, które, które za tym stoją. Ja, myśl, ja myślę, że oni za nisko dali tą, ten, ten obraz do tej, tej przeglądarki i się adres schował pod podium. Bo nie mógł znaleźć nie, to nawet... adresu, co? Nie, mi się paska, wydaje, że on nie miał adresu do, do prezentacji, linka nie miał za bardzo. Ale ktoś, tak, ale ktoś też mówił, że nie ma gdzie wpisać. Chyba, że no, coś, coś się pisze, no nie wiem. No, ale no, jest to dziwne, idziemy jest, tam jeszcze tak. do dyskusji się dołączyć. Zobacz. No możemy przejść po prostu, tak to tam będzie. Wie co się tędy?
we looked into it a little bit a couple years ago. I actually have a colleague who is at uh, Northeastern University in Boston, and she works a lot with, um, the, and I got to know him through the work in the autism space, but he works a lot with children with, with autism. Uh, and, and basically what she's trying to do is do a lot of physiological reporting to be able to predict the onset of different behaviors. So I, I view it, you know, children with autism is very highly motivated, and so they don't communicate, you know, in the ways that we're used to communicating uh, and so you can use things around kind of physiological data to kind of then predict like when they're going to, you know, not feel great about something or et cetera, because they have, you know, issues with verbal communication. And so we took a lot of that same kind of ways to measure and essentially kind of technology, potential technology, as well as the algorithms to help look at that source of noise and apply that to PR. And so we were simply looking at things like how arrivals for different pieces of content would look like, right? And then how does that actually Sorry, translate Mike, the time? Uh, yes, please. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to go back into the room. Sure. Yeah, no, no problem. Just say goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great question, Michael. Um, it would be interesting to see you. Thank you so much. I hope to have you sure, back Daniel. sometime. That'd be great. And uh, if you know anybody and your contacts and that enjoy things like you just had join us, please, you know, recommend us or uh, send us a few good reasons for coming to town. Thank yep. you so much. Of course, Daniel. Bye. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, but anyway, so we were just looking at that. We weren't looking at any learning performance outcomes. Uh, but that would be the next thing to do was to see how does, like, because we were looking at speech induction. So we were looking at heart rate and heart rate variability. And so we were looking at these things to understand how you can use that information to then predict performance, right? And how does that actually like affect performance? So that would be the next step. We haven't quite got there yet. Uh, but that's something that's on kind of the, the to-do list for us and for the work that we want to do. Thank you.